I've interviewed SLP, PT, and now OT, occupational therapy. Becky, inpatient OT, and Tamara, outside OT, discuss why they help not only specific healthcare and why are younger and older with aphasia. Please subscribe and see you later. So my name is Becky Van Buscombe and I am an inpatient occupational therapist. I work at MedStar National Rehab Hospital and I mainly work on the neuro team. So brain injury and stroke. Um, yeah, I've been here for almost five years now. Yeah, I'm Tamara Rogers. Um, I'm an occupational therapist also. I work now with um, a nonprofit organization called Brain Injury Services, which does um, ser provide services in the community, at people's homes, virtually, and at our office. And I also used to, I've been here a little over a year now, and I also used to work at um, National Rehab Hospital also and was an inpatient OT there on the neuro team. So I know that world a little bit too. Why did you become an OT? I have always been really fascinated by like the human body and anatomy and especially the brain. I just think it's like so amazing. Um, and then I'm all, I've also been really fascinated by like how people's identities are linked to like what we do. And so occupational therapy is like a really good blend of those two things. I think physical therapy is like cool in its own right. I'm not trying to diss on them, but it's a little more like medical model. And I think occupational therapy is a really cool combination of both and allows for a little bit more creativity and really is focused on function. So I think initially I had a lot of experience working with kids with special needs, and that was my first exposure to occupational therapy. Um, and then as I got more experience, I narrowed down even more like what I, what my favorite population is and kind of that's how I got really into brain injury and neuro and that whole world. Um, and I still love working with adults and kids, which I've been fortunate enough to do both of both at NRH and also now with brain injury services, getting to do a little bit of both. So I just think like the brain injury world and the neuro world is such a special and unique role for occupational therapy, especially even more so than some other populations. So I just like love being able to be that I feel like occupational therapy, like the name occupational therapy kind of does a disservice to the profession overall, because it's kind of misleading. Like I've had so many people be like, I don't, I have a job. I don't need you. Like, mm -hmm. and like, it's, I don't know what a better name would be like, maybe like functional therapy. I don't know. But I think like occupational therapy is understandably confusing for people because like we all have occupations, whether like it's professional or not. And that's what the name means, but it's confusing. Yeah. So I did not know what occupational therapy was until I got to college. Um, you know, I went to college not knowing what I was going to do. And my mom was actually like, hey, you should think about this. And, you know, I think the world of my mom and she's like the smartest person I know. So I was like, all right, let's do this. Um, and the more that I learned about what OT is and really similar to um, Tamara, I love that it's like such a blend and combination of looking at like the science, the medical background, but then you get to be very creative and very um, patient first and kind of making every session to revolve around that patient, that client. And that's a really like unique thing that I think that a lot of other jobs don't have the opportunity to do shadowing more than getting into school. Um, I was like, Oh, this is like such a good kind of blend of just like my personality. Um, I feel like I am a very creative person. And so getting to use that, but then also getting to be very people person and people oriented, you know, we get to spend so much time with all of you that building these relationships has been amazing. And then, um, being able to focus on like the function of what's important to you and helping you get to do that. Cause you know, something's important to one person and something's important to another and OT is cool because you can really focus on such a wide um, variety of different things. What about uh, the different PT and OT? Yeah. I mean, 
I think here at the hospital, at least for me, there is a lot more overlap of what we are doing. You know, when you were here and we were working together, Sarah and I would do similar things for physical therapy, working on balance and strength, but she probably did a lot more walking and stairs and your endurance where um, I would kind of use those skills like balance and standing, and then we would do a shower or we would practice um, your transfers or we would cook in the kitchen, um, working on your balance and things like that. So it's taking it like one more level forward and working on a functional activity, but there is some kind of crisscrossing going on. Yeah. I uh, Three years ago, I was shower and you said, uh, armpit, kitty, armpit. <laughs> chicken wing, chicken wing. Yeah, chicken wing, chicken wing. <laughs> don't, you thank, don't you want to thank her for that? She said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm thankful to uh, uh, Becky. I I, kitty, armpit. Mm-hmm. Oh, and I remember uh, Becky and I uh, cooking the cupcake. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I feel like PTs yeah. are always like think probably think OTs get to have all the fun. Like you get to cook, <laughs> yeah. you get to it's play. So <laughs> We worked a lot on your hand. Yes. Um, And so traditionally, the OT is going to focus more on the upper body, the hands, the PT is going to work on your legs, your feet. Um, And yeah, for you, we had to do a lot of stretching because you were really tight. Um, And now it's beautiful. I was (laughs) Yes. Your hand was very (laughs) sweaty, (laughs) abnormally sweaty. (laughs) I I am... Apologize. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be fair to say like, oh, it's harder for younger people with aphasia or harder for older people. I just think it's different. Um, and I think like in a couple ways that I can think of, one is that there's just less pe- less younger people with aphasia because yeah so many of the primary causes of aphasia increase with age. So like Mm -hmm. strokes and also just like the longer we live, the unfortunately more likely we are to be in some sort of accident that can cause aphasia. So there's just less of a community for younger people with aphasia, which I think like you're doing such important and great work by trying to like change that and like create more of a network and an outlet for younger people with aphasia because the challenges are different. A lot of the things that young people with aphasia want for themselves and kind of have as part of their day to day, like I can relate to it's no different. So, you know, trying to establish ourselves professionally, like dating, moving, finding hobbies, like kind of figuring out what life is going to look like for us. And I think for older people with aphasia, though there's certainly different challenges in their own right, a lot of those things maybe aren't as much at the forefront. We were talking earlier about how like, I think one thing that makes aphasia so hard is that like, there can be an assumption, a wrong assumption that like, aphasia equals like a loss of intellect, which like, it doesn't always like it often doesn't sometimes there's kind of comorbidities, but not always by any means. And I think that you know, even people who mean well often just kind of assume that because it's taking someone a little longer to get their words out that it's because they're not thinking clearly. And I think like, you know, that's Kitty, you know, better than anyone, like, that's just not the case. Um, And I think that can be hard at any age, but I imagine it affects younger people in a different way than it affects older people too. to constantly have to be like, no, like, you don't, I don't need you to just like shout louder. I understand what you're saying. I just need like a minute here. (laughs) in the past couple of years, there are, have become, there are a few more like prominent figures that have spoken more openly about their aphasia, you being one of them, but also like, um, Gabby Giffords and like Michael Hayden and some of these kind of like bigger political type names who have aphasia, but also have intact intellect and have spoken more openly about that. And so hopefully that kind of continues because I think it Again, I think like most people, not everyone, but most people like mean well and want to communicate effectively and nicely and just like don't know how. Here at the hospital, I have a good job of, or I do a good job of kind of being like a chameleon in the sense of being able to get along 
with any type of patient, whether it's like a younger patient. So being able to relate to them being like silly, goofy. I mean, I feel like you and I, Kitty, were (laughs) had a lot of laughs. Um, And then, you know, on the other spectrum, being able to like interact well with like 80, 90 year old patients. So I think that's like, that's a good skill that I've had. But then I think um, another superpower I have is I'm a very thoughtful um, source of like light in people's day where I really like to make handmade cards and like little treats. And so I think that I feel like that's a superpower is just like being able to brighten up people's days with like little thoughtful reminders. I think like one strength of mine as an occupational therapist, probably as just like a person too, is that like, I am really invested in whatever it is that I'm doing. And so I think like, if I'm working with a patient or a client, like in Bavix, we've kind of articulated what our goals are going to be. I am like in it to win it. And I think like that works for some people and for others, like I've had to kind of teach myself how to tone it back a little bit because not everyone approaches it in the same way I do. But I think like, regardless, like people do appreciate when they feel like you're in it with them as much as possible. I don't claim to be able to like, be able to know exactly what someone who's going through it is feeling. Cause I think I can't, but as much as possible, I, I try to make my patients, my clients feel like I'm like walking through it with them and like want this for them in the same way they want it for themselves. As an occupational therapist, I figured out different ways to motivate different, similar to Becky, like different types of clients. I think that's something like that anyone who wants to be a good healthcare worker should try to figure out a good occupational therapist, um, especially because like Becky said, people tick different ways and respond to different things and what works for one might not work for someone else. And so I think I have an ability to do that. I think it's something I've worked hard on too, to be able to like try to meet people where they are. I think occupational therapy, like the center of it is activities of daily living, ADL. So like going to the bathroom, taking a shower, putting your pants on. And I think like that's how a textbook would define occupational therapy. That's how like Wikipedia would define occupational therapy. But I think, you know, to really understand while like being able to pull your own pants up is certainly important. It's not really like what gives life meaning. Like, you know, there's just so much more to it. And I think OT is such a good field for that. And I think like I buy into that so much. And so I hope that I also impart that on my clients. 